Hi guys, this is Felix from SS1 Performance. Welcome to part two of the video explaining my uh, three phase permanent change model. The first video I described what the um, fat loss client is sort of gonna be um, dealing with on phases one, two, and three. And um, I gave a bit of context as to sort of why I developed this model or why I've been operating using this model. On this video, I'm gonna describe the function client and the muscle gain client. Again, this is all quite long form content, but uh, I'm gonna be producing clips. So if you're looking for a quick version of some of the elements, you'll get that from uh, you know Instagram and TikTok and things. So when it comes to function, that is another way of saying sort of movement proficiency or movement efficiency, an example of, of a client that I would put into the sort of function sequence, that would be someone who has um, sort of uh, tight trapezius muscles, who keeps on getting injured when they reach overhead, that is stopping them from exploring activities a lot of the time to high, level of, high levels of intensity. On an ongoing basis, they keep on getting these setbacks caused by injuries, which is, you know, not good. So when it comes to function, we want to get their joints articulating properly. We want to get their muscles um, and nerves trained properly to facilitate efficient and proficient movements. And we call it on phase one, or I call it the neuroproprioceptor phase, followed by foundational strength and then finally calisthenics and sport. Now, briefly, what I need to do is explain why does this say neuroproprioceptor? The reason why is that there's a sort of a misconception about um, muscle function that I'm noticing more and more. Uh, it's sort of a, an interesting one. So if you can imagine a steak, right? You, you, you get a steak and you can kind of pull it apart like this and stretch it and everything. A lot of people assume that when you get a sort of a, a pull a muscle or something like that, that uh, you know you stretch the muscle to a point where it uh, it sort of tears, right? Like it's just oh, it's just reached its end point and then it's torn. But actually, the correct way, uh, in my opinion, to, to look at this is closer to a stake with lots of cloves pegs at different points in it. Imagine that stake just sitting on a, on a plate or whatever, and then you imagine putting lots of clove pegs in it so they can be you know, pinching a, a bit of tissue of the stake here, or they can be released. Then imagine that each of those pegs has a wire that goes into a computer and on that computer is a software engineer who can tell, you know, peg 36 to compress this much or peg 48 to release this much. And this guy is basically typing away and, you know, making one peg do this, one peg do that. And that is actually how the stake works. So if I then go and pick up the stake, right, you can say, and then I pull it apart, you can see how immediately you're probably thinking, well, it's gonna pull apart purely, almost entirely at this point, based on what that software engineer is telling the closed pegs to do. So this is my way of describing what the nerve function is that governs, governs the muscle. So we're all sitting there thinking, oh, I just pull this muscle here and then like let it go to here and then that's it, you know, and it's just all oh, the muscle tissues are just torn, you know. But in actual fact, it's, it's more like the nerves and the proprioceptors in the muscles um, that are giving the um, nervous system and the brain information. And if those uh, nerves are not, um, you know, let's say appropriately trained to release those pegs at the right time, they're gonna do the opposite. Someone's gonna tell the software engineer, hey, by the way, Felix is gonna pick up that stake in a minute, mate. So um, can you just do a bit of uh, work to ensure that when he does do that, can you release all of those pegs on all of those areas so that the muscle can go to its end point? If that software engineer doesn't get that message, then he might have, let's say, pegs five to 25, all in the closed position, or he might, uh, you know, have uh, some kind of um, setup which says, right, I'm seeing this open, I'm seeing that open, I'm seeing that open, and I'm seeing that area open. He doesn't know why that's happening. He doesn't know that I'm going and pulling the stake. He just sees a lot of things on the screen that don't make much sense. So he says, okay, well, we better close that, close that, close that, close that one, pinch that one, pinch that one. All the while, Felix is over there pulling this thing apart. And so you've got the software engineer telling all of the uh, pegs to close, and then you've got me over there pulling my stake apart 
for you know the reasons of making this example and you've got two people working at polar opposites to each other so we need to connect those two people together and say by the way I'm gonna start messing around with this and then he says no problem uh, I better do some releases here here and here so that is how uh, that's why it says neuro slash proprioceptor on phase one for function because a lot of people think oh I'm a sports massage therapist you know I've got my level four certificate Felix will just tenderize my shoulders and that'll be fine no problem at all that does work to a point but at the end of the day we need to retrain those nerves so that when you do raise your arm above your head we don't get any um, proprioceptive sort of uh, uh, issues where suddenly the muscle goes whoa hold on a second are you, are you trying to shorten me you're trying to shorten me i don't shorten i'm i'm over i'm over here like i spend my life like this don't you dare try and put your arm over your head because you know we don't do that over here bro so we need to train those nerves properly that's my long-winded way of explaining well something i explain to all my clients and now it's out in in public i'm sure there's going to be some neuroscientist who will go and debunk the whole thing but i don't think so because uh you know, it is the nerves that govern the muscles and the tissues do tend to go quite far before they break. And when you see lots of people um, having injuries at points that are not end range, you have to think, well, that is going to be a lot to do with the nerves. So, hey, uh, you know, I guess round one, uh, ready and waiting. For the phase one client, we know what function is. Um, we know, well, you know what my position is in terms of uh, how I look at muscles, is that I'm not really looking at muscles so much as I'm looking at proprioceptors and nerves. And so therefore, the thing that we need for this person is functional biomechanics. Now, uh, the guys who do this the best are at the Gray Institute. Uh, that would be Gary Gray. I've done CAFs, 3D maps, and the foot and ankle specialization, which is very useful. That's basically a... Um, what would you describe it? It's a basically a way uh, he, they look at the body in a fundamentally incredible way which transforms my ability or transform my ability to train my clients effectively by giving me a whole load of uh, a library of exercises that it's based on biomechanics of the body rather than based on sort of like what the industry would say is a useful exercise it's looking at it from the point of function first and then translating that function into an exercise so we need to um, get this person operating and moving in all three planes of motion, sagittal, frontal, and transverse, sagittal being forwards and backwards, transverse being rotation, frontal being side to side, if you want to put it simply. On top of that, I'm going to get them moving in all these different ways. I'm then going to use my sports massage to help to further release those muscles or tell those nerves to chill out a little bit. I then need to educate this person on the neuromuscle function. One perfect example of this that I can provide is um, when someone uh, gets a cramp in a particular muscle. The education is incredibly important here. So the amount of times when someone gets a cramp, what they do is, oh my God, on my neck, and they start going uh, uh, like this, and they start yanking their neck off to 45 degrees that way. Um, and you know, or when people get a calf, um, when they, uh, they get a cramp in their calf and they immediately get someone to yank their foot in the opposite direction and stuff like this. Hey, you know, if someone more educated than me wants to go and tell me that that's a good thing to do, no problem. Uh, you're gonna have to present a pretty firm case as to why that is. So what I do in that case, that education is, let's say, okay, someone's got a cramp here. Oh my God, I've got a cramp. It's like, okay, stop. Do nothing and they go oh what do you mean do nothing i say breathe just breathe in through the nose out through the mouth tell your nervous system through your breathing rate that everything is fine okay because if someone's put you've got that software engineer if the software engineer of the nervous system is pulling on that muscle like this and then you're trying to pull it back out again it's not gonna be good for the tissues so breathe calm okay long deep breaths and then usually what they do is they and then they keep on doing this and say don't touch it don't do anything just tell your brain that everything's fine calm down let the signal disappear eventually the software engineer understands what's going on he goes oh hold on a second let me stop messing around with this muscle here because it's not going to help anyone and then we chill out and then we might ask were you hydrated what are your electrolytes like are you stressed what's your sleep like there's a few questions that we could ask to maybe say you know is your magnesium glycinate you know are you taking it or are you saying to me that you're taking it but you're not really all of these questions might be asked afterwards or they might have just been pushing their body quite hard this is an aspect of education for muscle function okay people need to understand that just because something's contracting it doesn't mean you go and yank it apart you have to 
play with your nervous system and understand how to tell it everything's fine. Then there's guided nutrition um, because we want to ensure that their muscles are um, you know, fueled and hydrated, etc. And then we use foundational strength as well to sort of start looking at fundamental patterns like squats, deadlifts, etc. But we're mainly using the foundational strength in order to improve posture. For example, if I hold a barbell here, that has quite a positive effect on my posture. That's how I look at it. I use barbell training to improve symmetry and posture. So um, that's the phase one for a function client. They then move on to foundational strength on the second phase so that, well, the way that I look at it is this. If I can get someone to, someone's neuro, uh, nervous system desensitized, I can then go into a foundational strength program with them, a proper one where they do squats, deadlifts, lunges, um, possibly hip thrusts. Then you've got you know horizontal push and pull, so bench press and rows, and then vertical push and pull, so you know pull ups, lat pull down, uh, and overhead press. So there's sort of like eight fundamental foundational strength patterns that I'm going to uh, engage someone in um, in order to create p more permanent changes in their body. Now. Um, that happens at phase two with the person who has issues with this sort of stuff where they've got a nervous system which doesn't understand that muscles are actually allowed to shorten and lengthen without massive problems. And then what they do is they move into more of a focused nutrition approach, which as you can see on the bottom left hand corner is uh, where we start looking at the numerical side. For anyone, again, I said this on the first video, for anyone who's like saying, oh, well, surely you would blend these. Why are you separating them? Refer to the phases blend on the top of the screen, which has a watercolor painting, and the watercolors are merging together like this. Uh, if anyone knows how I can transform this uh, one pager into a watercolor painting, then that would be great. But I don't think it would be possible because I feel like all the letters will start, it'll just look a bit confusing. But hey, you know, you never know. Maybe there's a way we could do it. And anyway, phase three for this particular client is calisthenics or sport. Now calisthenics and sport is on phase three due to the fact that calisthenics requires a huge amount of, um, huge amount of uh, isometric and core strength. The core not just being your rectus abdominis muscles, but all of the muscles around the middle of the, uh, basically all the muscles around the trunk. The trunk is basically the HR director of the body. Um, everything from the upper body goes through the trunk, everything through the lower body goes through the trunk. The trunk has to make these two different people communicate with each other in a way that's uh, not too destructive for the body. And uh, so the trunk deals with lots of back and forth different kinds of energies as to translate them from top and bottom, plus the central nervous system goes through it as well. So I kind of, uh, I think about the uh, the trunk as kind of like the HR director of a company where uh, you know, uh, they've got quite a, a tough job. So the um, calisthenics or sport for the person who's had lots and lots of injuries in their trapezius and neck is going to come at the last stage. If they do jujitsu, someone can pull on their neck in a surprising way that they're not expecting. If they play football, someone can come in and tackle them. There's lots of variation, lots of shapes, lots of patterns, lots of um, variability. Uh, whereas foundational strength training is very fixed, okay? So a lot of people would say it's non-functional. I disagree with that. I think everything has its place, but we don't want too much variation with load. We want foundational strength, which is very formative or you know, basically like structured. And then once someone's strong, and their nervous system is ready. Finally, at phase three, we go into sport. So the muscle gain client is um, actually more straightforward. That's why I've not left much time to explain it because even with my, my, my consider the three phase permanent change model to be quite uh, kind of unique. I mean, I think there's a lot of PTs who would comment on this and say, well, I kind of do something similar. The muscle gain one is, is more straightforward. I wanna make sure someone's biomechanical function is good. Um, they're gonna to have to have a strategic nutrition plan where they've got you know nutrient timing, nutrient density, you know all of the good stuff from um, people like Renaissance Periodization. I've read a few books from those guys on like Mike Isratel and all that. You know, their nutrition needs to be on point and they need to be building strength. They need to be, uh, my thing is I need to, I wanna build someone's strength as soon as possible. If someone has um, a history of let's say back pain, I'm gonna sense certain markers at here, for example. I might say, right, I want you to get your squats to 60 as soon as possible with my help and in, in a way that's intelligent and, and correct. Whereas if someone's always, um, I don't know, let's say someone is a, a rugby player who hasn't done much training for a while, but uh, they have a history of strength training, I'm probably gonna park that that target somewhere closer to 80 to 100. And they're probably gonna engage in calisthenics as well straight away because I want them to have different types of strength. 
Um, I want them to have a really, really powerful sort of, uh, you know, strength foundation so that they can pull up, they can possibly muscle up, they can do sort of basic versions of front levers, but they can also squat, deadlift, etc. And their nutrition is fueling that muscle gain. Phase two um, for the strength, um, sorry, the muscle gain client is, um, this This is the bit where I need to explain in a second. So phase two for that person is gonna involve the fat loss. Now, there is a way that this changes, as you can see between these two phases, it says uh, there's like a circular arrow, uh, two arrows circulating. It says if the body fat is more than 20%. So what that means is if someone comes in, they've got you know 15% body fat, I'm gonna build muscle and strength. That's, that's the goal, that's what we're doing. And then after that, once they've built their muscle, let's say they've gained seven kilos, eight kilos of muscle, I'm then gonna say, right, phase two is strength and fat loss. I need to get you on a calorie deficit so that your weight comes down, but I need to push your strength up using possibly lower reps, possibly, in order to protect the muscle as your body fat comes down. That's the, the idea behind phase two. If I get someone who's 25% body fat, I'm gonna swap those over. So I'm gonna do strength and fat loss. I'm gonna say, right, you're 25% body fat, I need to get you down to sub 15% most likely. Whilst we're doing that, I want you to build as much strength as possible. And then once you're down at, let's say 13% body fat, then we're gonna add in carbohydrates and start building more muscle um, as the second phase. So those ones in the case of muscle building will change around based on someone's starting body fat percentage. And then either way, whichever person that is, whether they're bigger or smaller, the last phase is always gonna be calisthenics and sport, okay? There's going to be a lot of people who, who, who listen to this saying, well, I, I started playing football, you know, and then I got into strength training afterwards, or I've been a, an MMA fighter and I'm not even recommended to do much strength training. I'm mainly recommended to do mostly sparring. I'm exposed to all of these concepts. This three-phase permanent change model is not what I think everyone should do. It's simply what I do, okay? If someone is um, wants to get back into football, I'm going to take them through these phases first and then football will be phase three because I want them to be as good at football as possible. If someone comes to me and they're already playing football, great, no problem. I'm basically going to say, right, that phase, this is going back to that watercolor painting. Their, their, their phase three, their sport is already happening straight away in phase one. I'm not stopping them from doing anything. So then the last bit about this, just because we're coming up to the 20 minute mark, which is, you know, offensively long for, you know, TikTok and things like this. So this will just be done in short clips, is the observations about these three phases. Phase one is the danger zone, okay? Barely anyone seems to be able to kind of get out of this zone without a lot of hand holding. Um, hand holding. Whatever you do, if you take one bit of information from these two 20 minute videos, do whatever you can to complete your phase one, whether that's losing 10 kilos of fat, whether that's rebuilding your muscle function so you can move in any direction, or whether it's gaining you know, five, 10 kilos of muscle. Complete phase one. Don't let anything stop you from doing it. Don't let your brain start going, oh, well, uh, you know, uh, and now it's my birthday week, and oh, well, now it's, oh, Christmas is coming up soon. So, oh, well, I had a holiday. Don't let your brain do it. Power through. Do whatever you can to make sure that goal is done because I spend my whole life in personal training playing with the um, the child that is the unconscious mind. Uh, mine as well. Like I'm not, you know, I'm not saying anyone's immature. What I'm saying is the unconscious mind will find any reason, god damn it, like any reason to stop progressing, and you will be amazed at how people find themselves trying to. Um, oh, what's the word? basically stop themselves from, uh, from progressing to completion of a goal, especially when they're close to the finish line. So whatever you do, get through phase one, set your target and relentlessly pursue that target, okay? Even if your trainer leaves, pursue the target. Even if there's a pandemic, pursue the target. Even if something happens that is really horrible, really bad, Pursue the target at all costs, because if you can just get that big first phase done, then you enter into, as you can see from the screen, the safety zone. I say the safety zone, it's it's just a lot, a lot. It's not the safety zone, it's much safer. Okay, if someone said I'm gonna build 10 kilos of muscle and they built it, I tend to find that I can park them. What that means is that um, they could probably get away with doing their own training for a bit.
This is my observation. I found that my clients who get that first phase done, I can let them get on with it, I keep in touch, and they're still good. So whatever you do, try and get there. And then finally, you know, in phase three, it kind of shows that most people can get from phase two to phase three because it's the uh, it's it's kind of like easier to get there. But then the last point about this this whole talk is um, to try and find deep meaning behind why you're doing what you're doing. Try to think about things like you know your long term health. How long of your life do you want to be able to pick up your kids for without throwing your back out, playing football with them, things like that. Like whatever your meaning is, try to find it and make sure that you think about that every day because before you know it your brain will say well I don't feel like training and then you have to go well it actually doesn't matter how I feel because if my goal is to do x I should just train anyway or I don't feel like eating this particular food today and it's like well you kind of had a heavy weekend it's now Monday even if you don't feel like eating a healthy meal you should probably just do it anyway. So that's not something that a personal trainer can manage because they're not always around. That has to come from inside you. Hopefully this is a uh, good explanation of the free phase permanent change model that I've created. If any of this is useful to uh, personal trainers or clients of personal trainers or just someone who's thinking about trying to um, gain muscle, lose fat or try to improve their um, uh, state of their muscles and their muscle function, I hope you found this helpful. And um, obviously I'm going to be building on all this stuff over the uh, months and years to come on this channel. Thanks for listening and uh, uh, yeah, hope you guys have a, a good day.